Man, I love those tail lights. You know what else I love about this car? I'll show you. Well first up, this isn't just any stock S1, this is my personal S1, that's why it's been lowered 20 millimeters. And I've also got some black things being painted, like the front splitter, which I'm gonna have the whole thing completed uh, very shortly. The front silver fins that you see, just around there, have been painted black as well, just to make that intake look a bit bigger, a bit meaner. Wing mirror's been painted black as well, matte black, and the tailgate's been painted gloss black as well. That's all that's been done for the time being, but I've got an exhaust in the way, so. Stay tuned for that. So back to the things that I like most about this car. We'll start with the headlights. The, uh, these design headlights were first actually debuted on the S1 before the A1 facelift came out. They also featured these little red inserts within the headlights to make the car look a little bit more aggressive or a little bit more hungover, depending on which way you look at it. So yeah, I really do like how these new design headlights do make the car look more aggressive than the first generation a1 headlights, I'm so glad that they went with these. And I also love the um, that crease that runs the full length of the car all the way from the headlights and actually wraps around the tailgate. Uh, that also makes the car look a fair bit smarter as well. And it's also got a few little um, creases in the bonnet as well. And also the S grille that with those silver side slats, they make the car look so good as well. It, like Everything just comes together in such a perfect package. Now I wouldn't have bought this S1 if it didn't have the optional Quadra exterior styling package fitted to it because otherwise it's just too easy to mistake it as a normal A1. So the Quattro exterior style is like gives this Quattro stamp on the back door, which obviously you're not going to get from A1 because they're all front wheel drive. Also gives us a double spoiler. I think that to me that's the biggest feature that makes it stand out from every other A1. The boot is, it's good enough for a Super Mini. I mean, it's not huge, but it's not tiny either. Yeah, you can fit a few things in there. Got my bag there and uh, underneath there we've got a, uh, you know, battery and puncture repair kit, no spare tyre, just the uh, putty stuff that you put in your tyre to get you home instead. Also got some tie down points as well. You can also, yeah, get the um, cargo net going so you can put your bags and stuff and then get them well secured in there safely and so they're not gonna, you know, fly around everywhere when you're hooking in on these mountain roads. And also up, up top in the uh, actual tailgate, we've got the, that's where the safety triangles go. And we've also got like a little grab handle there. So you can have that from the other side and then just pull the tailgate down and close it that way. And from factory, the car also came with these Bridgestone Potenzas, 225 by 35 R18, so it's got the 18 inch rims. And these tyres also seem to be some of the grippiest tyres that you can actually get on this car, so that's why I'm sticking with them. And if you're a tall, lanky, streak of misery like me, then you're gonna to wanna to be driving this car, not sitting in the back, because... Uh, that's my driving position, so that's where I would be. Uh, I've got like, say, 10 mil clear of knee room, uh, no headroom at all, it's like minus three inches, and that's gonna be particularly bad if you're going a long way, you're gonna be like getting out of the car like that. And if the driver's hit, hitting speed bumps at speed, which is probably a bad thing in a uh, lowered S1, yeah, neck's gonna be going like it's gonna be broken, and then yeah, these headrests are pretty much pretty much useless because they're right between your shoulders. I mean, they can get it all the way up, like right up high. That's about as far as they go. And then they're still, for me, yeah, just above my so shoulders. So they're only useful for people like kids size, or unless you're four foot nothing, then you'd, you'd be fine back here. It is also a four seater car only. No middle official middle seat because there's no seat belt there for them. And besides, who's gonna be one of me sitting perched up in like, the knee room completely disappears and headroom's like, like who would want to do this? <laughs> However, in the front of the car is a different story. People who were crammed back there now have all this space to play with. I mean, even me, six foot four, plenty of headroom, no worries at all, even in a super me. Who would have thought? The back seats are about that much higher than the front seats because I've had to put the drive shaft down in the dips and had to lift the seat up and put them underneath to make this in quattro, not front wheel drive. So that's a sacrifice that we had to make, but it pays off when you're in this seat.
I really like the interior of this car because it makes you feel a fair bit more special than the uh, than the interiors of the other super minis that were out at the time. However, one of the problems that I do have with it is that the steering wheel feels slightly off center to the left. This is something that I only picked up like a few months ago after having it for 12 months. So it's not really a major problem, but just have a look at this. So we've got the stitching in the seat. One, two, three. That one's the middle seat. That's where the middle of the seat is. And then you can see that the uh, that kind of runs to about there. So the steering wheel is slightly like that far off to the left of the driving position, which is kind of weird, but it's not too bad, I suppose. Now in here, you got the speedo and the taco, and you also got the engine temperature and the fuel just there. And you can also get the fuel distance there. So if you're looking at that, then you don't really need that, but you can change this to min show many different things uh, like, just come out here, you put, use these two arrows here, go across that top menu, so you can go across radio, telephone, and then sat nav, so it's just got the compass on at the moment, but if you do have sat nav going, it'll tell you how far the next turn is and things like that, a bit of useful information. And then if you press this menu button there, press that, comes up with all these different car functions, and then you can use this wheel here to scroll up and down, and then you just press, click the wheel in, just like that, so you can have like nothing there if you just find it distracting, which I don't, don't think many people would. Press that again, you can go up to the digital speedo, that's the one that I always have it on. Go again, efficiency program, so you can get your current fuel, average fuel, and you go up again, onboard computer. So that shows you just the time, your average speed, how many k's your car's got on it, and how many k's you've done this trip. Now with the central media control unit, you can make it disappear by manually pressing it in like that, and then you can press it up and make it reappear like that. Uh, and personally, I like to keep it up. It's not really a distraction. It makes the car look cooler, and I like to see what kind of corners are coming up on mountain roads like this. Now with these four menus up here, it's not touchscreen, but these four menus up here do correspond to these four buttons here. Uh, so if you want to select destination down the bottom left, you'd come down here, press the bottom left, and that brings up all the different uh, options that you've got. So you can put in last destinations. So if you've got somewhere that you frequently go, that'll be in there and then you just select it and press go. And special destinations like airports and fuel stations and things like that. You can just go in there, like if you're running low on fuel and you just want to find out where the closest fuel station is, you just go into there and just go fuel station and it comes up with like the first 20 or so uh, fuel stations. Usually like in the city, it'll find one within like two or three K, so it gets you out of trouble any day. Now further down the dashboard, you come to the climate control settings. Now this is the temperature, fan speed, and fan direction. However, if you do have it on auto, it'll blast it, well not blast it, but waft it to wherever is most necessary. Most of the time he's out of these. Awesome little air vents, uh, open and close like that. But it also gives a little bit out the windscreen to make sure that doesn't fog up at all and a little bit onto the feet from time to time. Now coming down to the third and final tier of buttons, the rear demister is there, the front demister is there, so you've got both demisters there. Traction control on and off there, which actually does give you a little bit of a, a warning and heads up, leaves that warning light on and that warning does actually stay up. It hides, it hides, um, I don't know it actually adds another one of its tabs, so now that there was only four tabs before, it's now got a fifth one with an exclamation point saying stabilization control sport. Warning, restricted stability, so yeah. It kind of like freaks out saying, hey, what are you doing? And the last button here is drive select. So that doesn't actually bring up the drive select menu in the central control unit. It does, however, give you a prompt little message up here. So you just press the button to toggle it. You just press it once. It tells you that you're in auto. So that's what I'm currently in. Press it once more and it goes to dynamic, which opens up the left to uh, exhaust via a little electronically controlled valve, which makes it a little bit, a little bit more beefier and you can actually you can definitely hear the difference, especially low down. It sounds actually pretty beefy for a little two liter. And press it once more, it takes you to efficiency mode, which just tries to save as much fuel as possible and gives you, gives you that little E down there just so you know that you are in efficiency mode. Auto mode is probably the most comfortable one, although it is, it's hard to tell the difference between a lot of these driving modes. Uh, the sound is definitely the biggest one between efficiency and dynamic. However, the ride comfort doesn't really change that much. If you are really good at telling differences in things, then, you, then you'll then you be able to tell the difference in the ride comfort over like little jittery bumps. But overall, it's pretty much the same. It's just the note of the engine that uh, changes from going efficiency to dynamic. Can press this one here 
and then you can actually tell the car to call someone or navigate to somewhere. Uh, iNav, which means information from nav, which means, hey, nav lady, what did you just say or where am I going now? You don't actually say that, you just press out and then she'll, she'll tell you. <laughs> now this button here is customizable. You can go into the car vehicle settings and you can choose any of these that you wanted to do. I've got it to skip forwards at this time, but uh, when I first got the car, it was switch between radio and media, so you don't have to do it down there. Or you can turn the traffic program on and off. Uh, you can change the color of the uh, the map day and night. So if you go into a tunnel, it usually goes night, but if you want to go keep it daytime, you can, you can do it that way. And then you can obviously choose to keep the voice guidance on or off. Now also as a little added feature with the S1, you've got this removable or hideable armrest. Um, you do control that using this little thing here that you push in to control the ratchet. So if you just push it down normally, it'll stop there. But if you want it to be lower, you push that in and then you can lower it right down pretty much on top of the handbrake. Now, a lot of the time this does feel like it gets in the way of the uh, gear shift, but when it's down nice and low like that, it's not too bad. You can just rest your arm on it and change gears that way. But if you do have it up, all the way up like that, then yeah, it's, it's not as good. Uh, especially if you want to go for the handbrake. I mean, if that's right down, you got to like kind of like twist your wrist and kind of, you know, negotiate around that. So I just decided to get rid of it completely, then you got free access, total access to the handbrake and gear lever without obstruction. Uh, and then you can also open her up and throw some stuff inside there. Now it's actually deeper than it looks. So you can fit obviously, you know, a phone in there or any other kind of like wallets and loot in there so most of the time i just got it away like that anyway so i don't really use it that much right yeah this is a good bit taking the car for a drive now to start the car you do have to press the clutch in so you press clutch pedal and then she'll start for you so yeah it is a bit of a safety feature i think it's just to stop the car jerking forward if you were to try and turn the car over while it was in any gear so a little bit of a safety feature but most people don't really see it as a safety feature the s1's clutch has actually been renowned for being kind of difficult to judge i mean like it's it's difficult to feel that friction point in the clutch so that point where the car starts to move so it does take a little bit of getting used to but i found about half a dozen uh launches and you'll be right as rain not launch control launches, just like normal takeoffs. <laughs> the clutch has actually also been known for being kind of fragile with the S1, so constantly launching it is kind of kind of doing yourself a disservice because you're going to be trying to drive a car without a clutch, and that's not really going to be that fun. But once you get going, the gear shift, I, mean, I love the gear shift. It's not the shortest gear shift, however, it's one of the best. It's just got this, I don't know what it is, it's a smooth, kind of smooth but clunky feel to it it's i don't know there's just something about it that makes it so satisfying just to shift gears i mean especially the straight up and down gears like third to fourth or fifth to sixth just doing them it's, it almost like pops into gear by itself it's just so easy and it, when you're really going for it you can just like smash it through the gears without even like worrying about it now the throttle doesn't really give you that much feel through the pedal but it does give you enough to let you know whereabouts in the power range you are. Now the braking dead zone, which is the travel at the top of the brake pedal that you have to push through before you actually access the braking is about, about that far. So you have to push through about that much distance before you actually access the braking, which when you do access it is really smooth and progressive. So you're not gonna worry about uh, locking up or making your passengers uncomfortable by constantly braking hard when it's just so smooth and uh, easy to regulate. But if you do get on the brakes real hard and you get the ABS going, then this thing's gonna stop on a dime just about before it feels like it because you got that 225 section tires pulling up such a small and light car, and it just stops unbelievably quickly. You have to see it to believe it. Judge where the front wheels are, but you know, 
less enjoyable. You get a dynamic if you want more feel and feedback through the steering wheel because that gives you about two or three times more feedback than the other two modes do, which makes it great for um, driving on roads like this and it also opens up that exhaust. Uh, so you get the better steering and the louder exhaust or beefier exhaust and that's what makes this car so enjoyable on a road like this because it's so small and light and agile, good steering um, and the also kind of roughy exhaust down low. What makes this car so good on a twisty road? Uh, you've got the good steering, good exhaust and the car is just so light, nimble and agile. Right, yeah, coming off the mountain and heading back into town, I put the car back into auto mode and put the traction control back on. That way, it's just a better all around town car. Everything's nice, light, easy, quiet. That's a nice GT2 RS. Holy smokes. Woo! I love surprising people with the performance. I mean, especially like at traffic lights. This thing will leave XR6s and SV6s for dead at lights. It actually will. I've done it before. FTX XR6 with. I had three people in the car, still left him, and he was, oh, it was only one by like half a car length, but yeah, this thing can still hold its own against, you know, modern big sedans, nothing like RS's or AMG's, but it still goes pretty hard. Speaking of performance, this car does use Volkswagen Group's uh, famous EA888 engine, which is the two litre turbo petrol engine. It does have diesel variants, but this is the petrol. Uh, there are higher and lower performance versions, like the normal A1 uses it. The high performance version are uh, things like the Golf R, TTS, and even the Skoda Octavia RS. They're just the same engine, just more power, like higher tune, stuff like that. So the EA888 variant in the S1 produces 170 kilowatt at the flywheel, so it'll lose 20 to 30 kilowatt through the uh, drivetrain. So you're looking at about 140, 150 kilowatt at the wheels, give or take. And that power is delivered at a screaming 6,000 RPM, which is there. And you don't really need to be revving past 6,000 RPM. Even on track day, like, there's no real need to be going up past six because all the torque, the 370 Newton meters of torque, that's available from like 1,800 RPM to 3,000 RPM. So you can comfortably drive this car around all day without exceeding 3,000 RPM. So going to 6,000 RPM is excessive any day of the week. Now you will have noticed that this is the Sportback version of the S1, which means it's the five door hatch, not the three door hatch. So it's got all four doors, not just the two and then the one at the back. That does make it slightly heavier than the standard S1, which in turn decreases the 0 to 100 time from 5.8 seconds to 5.9 seconds. So there's really not that big of a difference. The added practicality of the five door layer, yeah, it's, you know, I'd say it's worth it because one tenth of a second, who's gonna tell? Plus, besides, you don't see S1s driving around that often, so the likelihood of pulling up next to a normal S1 if you're in a Sportback, it's not going to happen. That being said, the three-door version of the S1 wasn't actually sold in Australia, so you can't get your hands on one here unless you import it. So overall, the Audi S1 is a fantastic car to drive. I love driving it every single day. I drive it everywhere because it's my daily, um, so you might think I'm slightly biased towards this thing, but I've never heard of somebody getting in the S1 and not enjoying it. I mean, just because it's like small and nippy, it's so good in town and it's so good on these twisty roads. And because it's got the manual transmission, it does make it slightly rarer. And I mean, the fun of the manual transmission is something that's not wearing out with me. I mean, I've heard people say, oh, I'm sick of shifting gears and I just want an automatic just to make life easier. I've only ever own manual cars and I'm still not sick of them and I dare say that my next car will be a manual as well just because you can do stuff like heel and toe downshifting you can't do that with a automatic so I dare say it's a bit of a dying art really this is what's making the manuals more of a sought after uh, vehicle nowadays just because people are just making fewer of them the ride for this car is more than acceptable I mean this is the most refined uh, and smooth riding super mini I've ever driven. I mean, it's an Audi, so it's got that prestigious heritage, and that actually filters down into these A1s and S1s. Uh, you do 
you still feel all the bumps, but they're kind of ironed out, so they're not sharp. They're, they're there, but they're, they're not intrusive, they're not jarring. So as opposed to some of its older and or cheaper rivals, you can easily ride along on a not so perfect surface and still be fairly unflustered. And obviously being an Audi, it is unfortunately front end bias, which means it does like to push the front wheels wide and understeer when you're really hooking in. Uh, however, I've lowered my S1, so the center of gravity is slightly lower. And <laughs> ever since I've done that, it's somehow made the car understeer less and it makes it more of a kind of a, it takes it more of a neutral stance in corners. So it's not so much understeer, but it kind of wants to oversteer a little bit as well. So that makes it so much better to drive and so much, you know, like rewarding and less, you know, intimidating because understeer is something that pretty much no driver ever wants. So to get rid of that is a big victory. And the brakes, as I mentioned, are superb for balance and progressiveness. And I've extracted every ounce of performance of this car over many mountain roads. And not once have I even had brake fade. I've smashed these brakes <laughs> to with, within an inch of their life and they're still not faded. I've got out and seen smoke coming out of the wheel arches and smelled them and get the whole thing going. But yeah, still, not even fade, they're just the steel discs, but I don't know, either I'm not trying hard enough or these are just awesome brakes. The only thing that I would improve with these brakes is the dead zone at the top of the pedal. I would like that to be shorter so you don't have to press so far to access the braking, but besides that, these are some of the best brakes I've ever used. This, this car's engine note is quiet, but it's not dull. So down low it does sound beefy and then it does start to scream towards the top end. Um, I'd rather that down low beefy kind of uh, sound at the lower end that way well we don't have to bring the engine and you know save yourself some effort. Contrary to popular belief you can actually hear the turbo in an Audi S1. It is really quiet it does sound like a baby turbo but I found the best way to hear the turbo is to you go into a long tunnel put all the windows down and you get down to about two and a half thousand rpm and you gun it you hear the turbo spool up and go you hear it slightly, you gotta be like turn the music off and then you back off, you just hear it go tss. So you can actually hear it. I mean, I would like it to be louder, yes, but <laughs> to start with, I thought that it was like you couldn't hear it, but you actually can. This is sweet. Another good thing about this car, especially if you like to have the windows down, is just how not windy it is when you do put the windows down. It is, if you just put the front, just the driver's window down or the front two, it does get a little bit blustery inside but you put all four windows down and it's just like as cool as a cucumber in here it's not hardly windy at all so if you are looking at buying an s1 definitely go and check out its rivals from mercedes so the a250 i'm not going to say the a45 because that's an rs3 rival all the bmw one series the bmw is rear wheel drive the mercedes is front wheel drive and the audi is right in the middle that being said there are other rivals like the polo gti and the mini cooper they both provide excellent cars great fun cars to drive and even the Ford Fiesta ST, that's also a, a hoop to drive as well. So they're all front wheel drive except for the BMW. So being all wheel drive does make the S1 a little bit more special because these other manufacturers just aren't doing it in a super mini. So there are a few more things to mention about the S1. Uh, the first one is the indicator's got like two settings so you can push it down and it'll bounce back up and then it'll indicate automatically three times. So you only have to like tap it and it'll go three times. So that's enough to change lane, so you don't have to actually hold it, change lane, and flip, flip it back up. So that's pretty cool. The second one is the horn's pretty loud for a small car. It makes like if you only heard the horn and then saw the car, you'd be surprised because you would have thought that it was a big car coming up the road, and not like a tiny little super mini. The headlights, as I mentioned, are also the best ones that I've ever used. They shine so so far down the road, and they also shine further up the left-hand side of the road and less onto incoming traffic, so you can see more wildlife and blind less people while you're doing it. So if you are looking at buying an S1, definitely go ahead and take one for a test drive because in town they're quite refined and comfortable and then if you get it out, get it out onto a road like this, you'll fall in love with it because there's almost no other super mini in its class that's going to be able to keep up with it. Thanks so much for watching guys, I do rate this car 9 out of 10 because of what it is and how fast it is and what it has to offer, but then again it could be louder, I'd rather it be louder and have more feedback to the steering wheel for instance, but besides that this car is pretty much perfect for my needs, that's why I bought it and that's why I like it so much. So guys, take one for a test drive if you're looking at buying one. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already and like the video and comment below. See you guys soon.
Yeah.